Hey there, thanks for tuning in to Duck Bricks. I'm Chris, and welcome to a brand new episode of LEGO History. Why does LEGO destroy molds? Over the course of LEGO's 90 plus year history, they have made a lot of LEGO bricks. From the simple 2x2 to the most complex LEGO piece, LEGO parts are intended to fit together and interlock in a system, where every single piece builds on each other to allow you to have endless possibilities for creativity. So why exactly is it that for a company that prides itself on an interconnected system of bricks, that so many of those bricks are made for just one theme or one set and then never seen again? Well, the answer is simple. If a Lego piece is not used in five years of its creation, the mold will be destroyed, the piece will be marked as discontinued, and we're probably never going to see it again unless there's a very compelling reason to bring it back. This is fact. This is how Lego operates, and it's basically why we don't see a lot of older discontinued parts resurface into the market. And it's also why we don't see Lego simply reissue older sets. The fact is, most of the parts aren't even around anymore. But the big question is, why does LEGO do this? Why does LEGO spend so much time, money, and development effort into making individual pieces only to maybe only use them a couple of times and then destroy the molds? Well, to answer that, we have to step back in time and take a look at LEGO history. One of the most common questions I always see pop up is why doesn't LEGO just simply reissue old sets? If companies like Hasbro can do it for Transformers and other product lines, why won't LEGO simply bring back, say, the original Bionicle 2001 figures, or even go all the way back to the first Galaxy Explorer or Yellow Castle? Well, to answer that question, there are a myriad of different factors that play a role into why LEGO, with a few notable exceptions, will never just reissue an older set one-to-one. -one. First and foremost, each LEGO set represents years of incremental improvements to the system, from building techniques, to stability, and to playability. While it may not be as granular as every single set, at the very least, every single theme or set wave LEGO produces informs how LEGO will make sets in the future, and represents a learning opportunity. Sets that released even just a few years ago might never be released today, due to these improvements LEGO makes year after year. Take LEGO Exoforce, for example. A line of anime-inspired mech suits LEGO produced between 2006 and 2008. They were incredibly dynamic and fun to play with, but for younger kids, difficult to pose and keep standing, and quite fragile. LEGO designer Neek, who goes by Tooth Dominoes Online, stated explicitly that the first wave of Exoforce is directly responsible for a lot of the restrictions and guidelines you see in current LEGO mech design, mostly due to size, amount of articulation, and structure of the build. The complex torsos often fell apart, the knees were too confusing, and the joints were not always strong enough to hold up the limbs. For kids with less LEGO experience, these were some of the major issues. Because of this product feedback for LEGO Exoforce, the company now takes a drastically different approach to mechs, bolstering them with reinforced builds and even removing articulation in favor of a more stable toy that can be played with by all. Now some could argue that they course corrected too far in the wrong direction, but that's a topic for another video. The point is, this is just one example of LEGO learning from their mistakes in the past and a big reason as to why LEGO is unwilling to just re-release an older set. The only times I've done that have been either early in the company's history when they were still finding their footing and all sets were generally on equal playing field in terms of stability, or if a set sells incredibly well and still holds up today, and most importantly, is built using currently available LEGO parts, like the Taj Mahal reissue, Vestas Wind Turbine, Saturn V, and Ship in a Bottle, just to name a few. This logic even applies to specific LEGO parts. For an example of how a piece has evolved over the years, look no further than the simple Bionicle ball and socket joint piece. Introduced in the late 1990s for Throwbots and Roboriders, the precursors to Bionicle, and later popularized with Bionicle G1, launching in 2001, the standard socket element was durable, poseable, but in rare occasions, did tend to break and snap a problem that was exacerbated in later years, when LEGO used different types of plastics to make lime pieces, causing a notorious epidemic of brittle lime joints in 2007. Drastically course correcting in 2008, the part was redesigned, but this turned out to be a step backwards, making the piece more brittle in pretty much every color variation. By 2011, LEGO introduced CCBS, the character and creature building system, which featured entirely redesigned and remodeled ball and socket joints that were so stable that they were used for years and still hold up incredibly well. But by 2021, LEGO decided to update the part yet again, increasing friction and improving the stability. Which brings us to the socket in use today, which allows LEGO to release it in metallic colors like pearl gold without fear of cracking. 
It's parts like these that prevent LEGO from ever re-releasing, say, a Bionicle G1 set one-to-one. -one. The joints are strictly and empirically inferior, and years of iteration has proven that. But that brings us to the crux of this video. The most important reason as to why sets are not simply reissued is the fact that molds used to create LEGO parts are destroyed after five years of not being used in a set, and a strong case must be made to keep them around. This may at first sound counterintuitive. Why destroy a piece that you may spend years developing? Well, there's actually a really good reason as to why this is the case. This information comes from The Secret Life of Lego Bricks, an exclusive book detailing the company's inner workings that was unfortunately only available during a brief and short crowdfunding period in 2020. Other than placing a pre-order and crowdfunding the book all the way back then, there was and is no other way to get it, which is a shame because it's probably one of the most interesting exposés on how the LEGO group functions ever published. However, in interest of making this incredibly limited edition media available to as many people as possible, I purchased the book secondhand for hundreds of dollars and have gone ahead and linked a PDF of the book in the description below. Feel free to give it a read. Back to the topic of destroyed molds, there are a number of reasons as to why this is done. The book cites the fact that it is more economical to destroy molds than to keep them in storage, meaning it is literally cheaper for LEGO to destroy the part molds than to pay to store them in a warehouse, especially if they're not being used. But when did this start and why does LEGO not just keep them around to begin with? As you'll find out, this is not really the main reason as to why LEGO destroys molds. Sure, it is cheaper to destroy them, but that's not really the reason why LEGO does it. The interesting thing is that that was not always the case. Before the year 2000, it was incredibly rare for a LEGO mold to be destroyed. The parts palette just continued to grow year after year, and prior to the mid-1990s, LEGO didn't even have an electronic database of all their pieces. Instead, designers relied on an analog element archive, personal lists, and their own memories to know which parts were available and which were not. Retiring elements and destroying molds, as I mentioned, occurred very rarely, normally only when a new or better element came along and replaced it, like the switch from 9 volt power functions to better electronics for trains. But everything changed in the late 90s to early 2000s. During a period of great financial upheaval for the company, poor decision making internally within the LEGO group caused them to rapidly create hundreds of single use molds for one off sets, highly specialized parts that could rarely be used outside their intended purpose. This rapid expenditure and expansion of LEGO's part catalog meant that it was simply no longer feasible to keep every mold around forever, especially when these molds were tailor-made for themes that performed poorly, making them unusable when that theme ended. Over just a couple of years, storing such a large number of molds, elements, and color variations had become impossible. At that point, it became clear it was time to simplify the element library. To do so, the company gathered a group of veteran designers, forming a team to use their extensive knowledge of parts and colors to reduce the number of molds and parts needing storage by the thousands. One of the biggest examples was in LEGO Wheel Elements, which at the time had over 100 different variations, many of which shared the same diameters, with only slight differences between them. It took an entire decade from 2000 to 2010. But by the end, designers had assigned ID numbers to every element, created a company-wide database to manage its parts catalog called the Easy Builder System, or EBT for short, and began establishing standards for existing families of components that defined rules for when they could be added to. For instance, as I mentioned, wheels were a primary area of focus during this effort. After cutting over half the variants, only 45 different wheels remained, along with a fresh new guide for developing tires and rims only when explicitly needed. After completing their task, the responsibility for managing the parts library was rolled into the newly created role of Element Coach, with several of the veterans who completed the initial effort transitioning into that position. Jamie Burrard, LEGO design lead and judge of LEGO Masters, had this to say about the process. In order to keep a healthy balance of available building elements, we regularly have to decide which shapes are exited in order to make room for all the new elements that are created each year. For instance, when it came to train parts, barely anyone was using them for quite a while, so it became harder and harder to justify keeping them over other new elements that everyone else was using. Some designers have been quite creative at keeping elements alive, such as by using cowcatcher train elements as samurai mech shoulder decorations. It's not only showing off the versatility of our elements, but it also helps keep good elements active for future projects. Jamie's sentiment about choosing which LEGO elements to keep and which to destroy is emblematic of the company's current lean approach to the creation and destruction of parts. 
In order to keep innovating and getting unique pieces year after year, LEGO has to keep a healthy balance of parts in their catalog to prevent bloat and unnecessary costs to keep molds around, which need to be stored in climate-controlled large warehouses. Because of this mentality, Element Coaches now lead a yearly parts catalog review effort, and thanks to the digital EBT database, they can tell exactly how many products a given part has been included with in recent years. From there, design teams each select an Element Ambassador from their ranks to join this review effort and make their case for parts that should be preserved for one reason or another. An element that may not be currently in use could be working its way through the approval process as a key piece in new products. However, this argument must be robust. The team polices the element library, keeping it trim and agile. And when an element doesn't make the cut, it's marked as retired and the mold is destroyed. This practice also stems from a study that was conducted during the initial reduction in elements, which yielded surprising results. LEGO found that for most molds, the cost of remaking them was less expensive than five years of storage. That finding became part of the calculus during yearly evaluations. If a strong case can't be made for an element in the next five years, retirement is cheaper than storing its mold. All this to say, there are a lot of reasons as to why LEGO won't just resurrect an old set or old part one to one. Durability and stability of the build aside, most LEGO parts that were around just five years ago are simply not around anymore. The element frames, as LEGO calls them internally, have been allocated to newer parts and newer sets. The cost to make a new mold is incredibly high, and most themes are only allocated a set amount of new element frames each year. Gone are the days of Bionicle G1, where individual sets would feature specific molds for a mask, weapon, armor, and even limbs, many of which would only appear in that single set. It's simply not how the company functions anymore. A huge reason as to why LEGO is so popular and successful today is that they have learned their lessons from the past. Just as sets are more durable than ever and pieces are less brittle than ever, LEGO as a company is leaner and more cost efficient than ever before. Why take a risk and spend a huge amount of money, development time, and resources on producing dozens of new molds for a theme in a year when best-selling lines like Ninjago or Star Wars can make things feel fresh with just a couple new molds per wave? The bottom line is, LEGO is a lot more risk-averse as a company than they were years ago, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. They're certainly doing a lot better financially than they were in the early 2000s, and that boils down to this agile, dynamic approach the leadership has taken to keeping the element catalog slim. That being said, LEGO is not above resurrecting molds should a particular use case arise. One of the most recent examples has been in the reintroduction of Long Legs, created specifically for Woody from Toy Story in 2011, but discontinued shortly afterwards, until 2023, when they were resurrected for the Long Legs of the Navi from Avatar and Eggman from Sonic. In cases like this, however, this involved essentially redesigning the entire element from scratch. When I interviewed the designers behind LEGO Avatar, I asked them about this, and they described how the older piece, while nearly identical to this one, had to be remodeled due to the upgrades in model and element design technology in the decades since the part's original introduction. And it cost exactly as much as making an entirely new piece would have. There is even precedent, however, for molds being saved from destruction at the last second. For instance, when a four-armed minifigure component was made for Rio Durant and Solo from 2018, the piece did not appear until exactly five years later in the Stitch Disney collectible minifig in 2023, meaning that the one-off mold was just barely saved from destruction. The Ninjago Ghost Sword, created in 2015, appeared last in 2016 in a Nexo Knight set until its resurgence in, you guessed it, 2021, five years later for a Ninjago Legacy set, and now is still used today in unique ways, like the limbs of a Mantis in the Ideas Insect Collection set from 2023. And while most of these one-off molds are indeed destroyed after five years from specialized themes, particularly weapons and headgear from original and licensed sets, LEGO is very cognizant of fan demand, and will make it a point to bring back older elements if demand is high enough or if there's a strong need for it. They even keep an eye on the second-hand aftermarket for LEGO in terms of BrickLink to track how expensive and how popular certain pieces are especially after they've been discontinued. The biggest example of this is that after creating and destroying a mold for the LEGO GOAT in 2011 for a single kingdom set, LEGO finally brought it back this year in 2024, thanks to the resurgence of castle-focused sets with their recent 90th anniversary in 2022. 
even years ago, when LEGO Creator Expert decided to make a train focus set, they halted the destruction of train window molds to incorporate them in a now legendary Emerald Knight. They even explicitly will recolor pieces, like the standard construction worker hat piece in, say, Maersk Blue, to combat rising aftermarket prices on Bricklink with the release of the Maersk train, bringing the color for the piece back from promo sets in the 1980s. LEGO clearly has a system in place, and it's a system that works. By choosing to resurrect molds only when absolutely needed or when there is enormous fan demand, and otherwise letting molds live and die during a normal 5-year process, the company can operate at peak economic efficiency, learning from its mistakes and continuing to improve their sets, parts, and processes. That's all for this episode of LEGO History, and I hope you enjoyed learning more about this highly requested topic.